Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. (laughs) So I forgot there was a horse to get on. You're riding the pony down the side path. <laughs> I think I was on a wheel, and I've been rolling with that wheel. <laughs> You're inside it? <laughs> yeah. How does that work? <laughs> well, it, it doesn't work well. That's how, <laughs> one way it works. <laughs> so could you say you're over there reinventing the wheel? Mm, I don't think that would be accurate. <laughs> what are we talking about today? <laughs> you know what? The weather is fine. You know what? I almost didn't need a t-shirt today. Mm. I almost needed long sleeves. Oh, I was gonna. I thought you meant you were gonna go bare chested. <laughs> no. I didn't need a t-shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see where you might have gotten that. I got to do a little bit of tractor work earlier this week um, on some of my research plots, and uh, long story short, I mean, it was like we spent a whole day in the field. I even had to repair a flat tire at one point, and I didn't break a sweat the whole day. It was amazing. Wow. Man, I can't remember the last time I went outside and didn't break a sweat. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not far off, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I told one of the other folks that works in my shop this morning, I said, you know what? This is what it feels like on one of those mornings where you're sitting on a tree, mm. wait, you know, under a turkey goblin, or mm. if you go in July to northern Michigan, fish or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, on one of those cool water streams. I'm going to do like that with crisp. you sometime. Yeah. It's crisp, you know, even even up there during the summer. Yeah. But that's what it felt like this morning here. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, got me fired up a little bit. Golly, it's so invigorating. Mm-hmm. Well, to answer your question that you buried in that dialogue, uh, today I think we should cover what we know about wildlife preference for acorns. Okay. I get a, that question a lot, so I think our audience would be really interested to kind of hear what we know about it. Mm-hmm. Are there a good sampling of studies that have looked at this? You know, no. I'm not surprised. Isn't that what? I am. That's the weirdest thing, and our listeners may get, may be tired of, I don't know, maybe we haven't talked about this very much, but isn't it interesting how some of the most basic questions or, you know, like things that we talk about in in terms of wildlife um, have not been researched? Like some of the just really, really fundamental stuff. Like you would think, for example, wouldn't you think that there would be, I don't know, dozens of studies on white-tailed deer selection of oak? 100%. Of acorn species? Yeah. There aren't. I I, I didn't find a one. I didn't find a one on turkeys. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you would think I could I could see that being more so the case with turkeys, but um, definitely for deer, you would think they'd be out there. So there are some. I got there. There are lots of diet studies mm-hmm. where they look at what's in the diet, right? And then they infer preference from right. that. Right. Yeah. So like sometimes they look at scat contents that we've talked about a lot yeah. on here. Or rumen or, contents from yeah, deer. rumen or stomach contents and predators. And or, there is a fair amount of data on deer selection, that you know, quote-unquote, or preference, quote-unquote, mm-hmm. from what's, what's occurring in their diet because right. we have lots of samples, right? Yeah. It's the oak masting coincides with hunter harvest, and, you know, there's a lot of interest in what deer yeah. are eating. 
Yeah. So we have a lot of studies like that. But the only drawback to those studies is those diets are shaped strongly by the availability right. in the area. And so... So, yeah, you might, you may, uh, you know, take a sample from 30 or 40 deer from a property that's dominated by water oak. Right. And then find in their diet, oh, yeah, 80% of their diet's water oak acorns. Yeah. And then your inference would be like, man, they really love water oak. And it's like, well, they need acorns. And if the only species available is water oak, they will eat that. That does not mean that they prefer that over a white oak species or something else. And similarly, there's a presentation that I give about management of hardwood forest for wildlife, um, you know, teaching and various workshops and things like that. And there's several studies that I go through related to it. And one of them um, talks about the relative importance of acorns in game species diets. And it says specifically that, you know, in this one study that, you know, red oak acorns were like great represented greater than 50 percent of the diets of deer turkeys and Mm -hmm. so on and so forth from fall to spring and when i present that i always say you have to understand the caveat to this is the study was conducted in an eastern hardwood forest that was you know essentially all mature closed canopy so Mm -hmm. there weren't a lot of other options during that time of the year you've got to filter everything through that context yeah so what those kinds of studies tell us really well where we're looking at use is that oak oaks are important no doubt that i don't think there's any doubt that they are very important in the diet of many many species of mammals and birds and other things that you might find surprising here a little bit i've got some surprises for you too (laughs) (laughs) maybe not this one but maybe another one that we have coming up yeah well, that's good. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of the stuff on turkeys is, has just been like what which acorns are in the diet. Mm-hmm. And there's a really good chapter on this that's from Oak Forest Ecosystems, the book. Yeah. That's on wild turkeys. And it was written by uh, several authors that have done a lot of turkey work that mm-hmm. might be familiar to you, like, uh, probably Gary Norman would be the one that was that an early out. early two thousands late nineties book somewhere in there yeah it was edited to... doesn't matter it doesn't matter I uh, know we'll, the one we'll we'll link the chapter if we can I think mm-hmm. it's online uh, available I'm looking at it online so I'm assuming that we can link it somehow so folks can read about uh, you know Turkey specifically but a lot of the the data that we have on turkeys is based on what we find in their their crop. Sure. So let me get down to this table. 16. While you're looking for that, I'll mention that because um, I've done some of the, the crop contents analysis myself and even shared some of those results on the show. Yeah. But um, the challenge with that, you know, one of the things that always is stuck in the back of my mind is how representative crop contents are of – the diet when you know especially like during the spring a lot of gobblers are killed you know before they've even really started eating for the day yeah and and they're they're not eating much to begin with during you know spring hunting Mm -hmm. seasons anyway and then you know fall seasons i would say probably are going to be less biased for that reason yeah how what i was going to say a lot of the data is coming from fall Mm mm-hmm fall season yeah and i would predict that more of those turkeys you know are killed later in the day after they've had time to move around and forage a bit yes probably so and it's when mast is probably more important sure although uh, there is the acorns are showing up in the diet quite a bit in some studies in the spring harvest yeah yeah absolutely so uh, I, I point to this this book chapter because they basically summarized the majority of stuff on turkeys. Mm-hmm. So there are a bunch of authors in there that have done really cool work. And I thought it was kind of interesting that a lot of the food habit studies were from the 50s, 60s, 90s. So it's been around a long time. Yeah. 
yeah, now we're looking at really complicated, nuanced questions about yeah <laughs> all sorts of things. Um, but you know, we we're still getting back to the fundamentals too. Yeah. But you see that a lot, a lot of times when, when there is kind of this fundamental, really basic research that oftentimes if it was addressed, it was addressed decades ago, which makes sense. Yeah. So do you want me to summarize some of this or did you have something else you wanted to add? No, you're good. Let's jump into it. Yeah. So the, in terms of the Eastern subspecies, there's a, a good bit of data on it on average the com- the composition of their diet is highest in the winter mm-hmm. for acorns, which is about a third mm-hmm. on average, uh, 33.2%. Uh, the next highest part, which I, I was kind of surprised by this, uh, is 20.5% of the spring diet. 20.5%. Is is acorns? I'm gonna this call cross, that. I'm gonna call that twenty one percent in my notes. Is that okay? Yeah. So, but that just barely beat fall. The fall diet in these, you know, on average, is twenty point four percent. You so know you what's really interesting? From fall, winter, and spring, on average, more than twenty percent of the diet is acorns. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a pretty good bit. Yep. So I thought that was kind of interesting. The summer use falls precipitously, as you might sure. imagine. It's around 1%, 1.2. Right. In the in the eastern, at least. So a third during winter, and that drops to about 20% during spring. Um, mm-hmm. But still, obviously, a very significant component. Now, when yeah. you say a third... Or twenty percent? Are you talking about by weight? Are you talk? Are we talking about? It's kind of summarizing across a bunch of studies, and they all probably measured it a little bit or differently. Well, or I think, several ways. Yeah. So we've gotten into this before. Yeah. There's two Pretty, two yeah. really common ways, and a lot of times they're done together. Yeah. But I don't. I can't answer that because I don't know. Right. I haven't gone to each to each of the individual studies they summarized. Sure. But it's usually either frequency of occurrence. So you have how many, like if you looked at 100 turkeys diet, how many of those 100 have acorns in it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a snapshot in time, right? It's just what the turkey ate a while ago, right, today. So, you know, that's one way to get at it. And it's flawed because it's not a long-term thing. Mm-hmm. Right, but uh, if you did that over the course of a hunting season and looked at the frequency, it'd give you kind of a a good look at what on average is yeah is occurring on a day to day basis. Yeah, the other challenge to this too is we're going through these diet studies is that acorns would be really conspicuous in a crop yeah. as opposed to like a fragment of a clover leaf or a, or right. a piece of wheat that they've nipped off or yeah, something or some like bug, that. Yeah, bug bug parts right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big problem with particularly with other species like whitetail. Right. Uh, they have different uh, digestibility, for example. Yeah. The passage time. Yeah. So that's not as big of a problem with the way that we've done it with turkeys, but uh, it is still, you know, when, when they eat an acre and, and you look in the crop, it's obvious. Mm-hmm. you know so because it's often whole yeah or nowadays i mean you can leave off the a and it's just kern <laughs> yeah so I, I was giving you the averages but they did know there's a very large variation across studies e- even within a study across years within seasons so mm-hmm. I, I kind of ex- expressed that a little bit but uh you know it, it makes sense how dependent they are on mast and the southern Appalachians might dif- differ from pine flatwood. Yeah. Right. So uh, keep that in mind. There is a large amount of variation. Yeah. Okay. Just to kind of give you some bounds on that variation. You know, we said on average 
a few minutes ago about a third of the diet, right? Mm-hmm. That's across a bunch of studies. Right. But that could be on well, some sites as high as two thirds. Okay. So it's also in some studies has been as low even during the masting period when there is mast available as 10% or 11, 11%. So there can be quite a bit of a variation. The, there was a study in Michigan, for example, where it was 68%. Wow. Yep. And you got to wonder too, we already oh, talked about how that would be influenced there was by one the, in, There was one in Missouri that was 73%. Yeah, that's high. Yeah. And you got to think too, that's influenced by, you know, the land cover availability, like we've already talked mm-hmm. about. If it's predominantly deciduous forest, obviously that percentage is likely to go up. Mm-hmm. Um, but then of course you're also like by random chance, the years of the, where the years of the study fall and then relative to masting. Mm-hmm. So if it, if it falls, if the study falls in a bumper acre near, yep. you would expect the percentage in diets to go up versus in a year that there's near or complete failure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that is exactly the the case. You see, you know, obviously there's variation across sites, but there's also substantial variation in mast importance in a given year on yeah. a site. Yeah, which might be strictly related to the abundance of oaks, but it also could vary based on lots of other things. Like they may change how much they rely on it. Like for example, if we have a trillion cicadas hatch. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is why just kind of as a side note um, on, you know, as far as a property management perspective, that is one reason that, you know, I don't think this is the most limiting factor. So it's further down my priority list. I would rather Mm -hmm. address breeding season habitat stuff first but once that is adequately addressed, I start thinking about, you know, as far as my food plot program, because we've talked about that a little bit on the show lately, mm-hmm. I like to have um, some grains or some tubers that, w- that are going to be mm-hmm. available during the winter time as a supplemental en- energy source in case of acorn failure. Yeah. And so that's something that I think about when, and incorporate into, you know, management plans. Yeah. That's a good point. Just kind of reiterating that point about the mast availability there was one study the the folk the authors of this book chapter actually reanalyzed one of the the, the studies data mm-hmm. to ask this question but they looked at how, whether or not the proportion of the spring diet of turkeys was being uh, that were acorns was explained by the mast crop from that oh nice that given year yeah and uh the correlation in that study was perfect. Okay. I thought you're the way that you got that little grin <laughs> on your face. I thought you're going to completely undermine what I had just said. Earlier. No. <laughs> no, I, you know, while some things could change, like the cicada would be a really sure, uh, extreme example of that, but you could change how much they need the acorns. Yeah. Uh, even if they're wildly abundant. But in this study, when they looked at that, you know, uh, at that relationship, which was four years in the, the study. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, it was in Missouri, the study that they did that in. Mm-hmm. It was Korshkin's 1973. Was that in the Ozarks? Yeah, yeah. I believe so. Makes sense. Yeah, and they, d- they did that Spearman's correlation thing with it, and the percent use in the spring was was 100% explained by the the strength of the mass crop in the previous fall winter. Yeah, did they incorporate red versus white subgenus in that? Yeah, they well they had representation from the white oak and black and red oak yeah. groups. Cuz if it was just a good white oak group year, I wouldn't expect much of that to show up in the spring. Um just to due to differences in availability and germination. Yeah, they did know uh, both white oak and and black and red oak groups were included in the mast availability analysis. Mm-hmm. But would you expect if you had a poor red oak group year, would you expect, but you still had some white oak production, either good or average, 
would you still expect those white oaks to continue to show up in diets during the spring? Yes, not okay, to the so, same degree. Yeah, so enough of them still make it through and are are still viable. Um, well, I actually, what I would presume is that they're aiding ones that didn't germinate because they are not viable, but they still mm. have some good meat on them. Okay. I just always assumed if they weren't viable that they were kind of rotten and they didn't get eaten either. But some maybe don't. that's a false assumption. Some don't, but, you know, like if you had an acorn weevil in it, well, that's yeah. a little packet of protein itself. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's, that's a, something that's, that's been noted. Protein. <laughs> yeah, that's something that's been noted, and I personally have seen it in turkeys that I harvested yeah. where they ate. Uh, this was actually turkey oak, uh, coincidentally. How perfect. In North Carolina, I can remember harvesting a turkey or maybe a couple of turkeys now that I think about it that had that were their crop was full of acorns and uh there were quite a few of them that had a weevil in them mm -hmm. so you know that probably happens I, I think they're probably a little less discriminant of the viability of the acorn yeah but ones that are that are being lost to some sort of fungus or mold i yeah. think would be less likely to be consumed sure, sure. But I do think turkeys would be more likely even to consume those soured acorns than uh than other species like deer you know, right. that, that have a really keen sense of smell to right to that makes it. sense yeah just because of palatability. So, but here's this is also what makes our audience mad all the time, because, and this is why we always say things with less certainty than it being absolute fact. There was a study from your home state. Oh yeah. Yep, it was Good and Webb, 1940. Nice. It was a little bit before I was born. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah. So in Alabama, they... You should have said our home state, because technically it's your home state, too. Yeah. Well, I was trying to give you some of the... Semantics. <laughs> Semantics. I appreciate that, Marcus. <laughs> yeah, they, in that study... They found very limited use from the turkeys they sampled of acorns, mm -hmm. Com e even though many of the years were heavy mast crops. Okay, so what part of the state were they in? I don't you know. know. Okay. Mm -mm. And you don't know that, the, was it, you know, at least the season? Mm, spring was spring okay. turkey season. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because another study that we're going to talk about in an upcoming episode found something relatively similar. It wasn't, they weren't actually trying to address that question, but their data allowed them a little bit of insight into that. Yeah. And, and turkey use of, of acorns in that study was not high. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it, I, I guess I should throw in the caveat briefly here. I think... I don't think that it was that necessarily the turkeys did not want to eat the acorns, but maybe there was something preventing them from doing so. Hey, now. So there's other factors, right, that we have to consider with this. Yeah, that's what I thought of because yeah. I know what the other topic's going to be yeah. about. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice teaser, right? Yeah. So they do have some information on preference here for turkeys, uh, but, you know, keep in mind what we said earlier. Uh, oak mass appears to be preferred over other natural items. Mm -hmm. So they do eat a lot of it and they like it compared to other naturally available foods. But turkeys do not seem to prefer the white oak group over the red oak group. Yeah, that it seems counterintuitive, but for the reason that you mentioned earlier, that they don't have a well-developed sense of smell, I don't know that you would, <laughs> that would that's too surprising. Yeah, I, it actually, I, I did a lot of digging on this. Yeah? To try to figure out, and it unfortunately isn't available with turkeys, but it will be soon. Uh, that's a... Courtesy of you. Little teeter, teaser. I, I don't know if our audience has really uh, wrapped their, their head around this, but I'm really, really, really interested in the diet selection process and why things eat what they eat. Mm -hmm. and it's not acceptable for me for us not to have really robust information about 
that on turkey. So yeah, for I'm sure. gonna make sure that happens because I I just am fascinated with it for whatever reason. I I can't help it. One of the studies that I'm gonna cover was from my shop, and we do have some turkey data in it. But mm-hmm. the way that I have done a lot of those kinds of studies in the past, uh, we don't get very good representation from turkeys on the studies. Right. So I have done a bunch of acorn selection stuff, and it just doesn't usually include a lot of turkey data. But that's going to change uh, next fall. Okay. Uh, one of my mentors, in a sense, Billy Menzer, actually had some, yes. some cool stuff. I remember this. we've talked about his stuff before yeah. on here. Yeah. yeah. He did some really, that's a really cool experiment. If yeah. I, I think I know the one you're talking about. So that's probably the best. Yeah. So he had 12 oak species. This was Menzer et al., 1995. And he showed that swamp white oak, which has a relatively large acorn, was least preferred among the oaks and had a preference ranking comparable to pecans. Okay. Uh, Most species of oak mast were preferred over pecans and hickory and walnuts and Chinese chestnuts. So most oaks were preferred over those. Yeah. Okay. But what I was going to go back to, you know, you were kind of asking about preference and then you made a comment a few minutes ago about why the, you felt they may not like white oak yeah. species. It seems to be oh, driven I remember this. more yeah. by size of the yes. acorn than anything. Yes. Isn't that funny? What's funny? I just, how that works out. I mean, you think about like with deer, it, it, I think it's more strongly driven by the taste or the palatability. And with turkeys, yeah. it's another factor, it's size. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I did, I f- found a few interesting little tidbits in here. Yeah. That I have, I need to go back and really dig into these resources. But you know what, I, I just said it a minute ago, I, when we start talking about what eats what and mm-hmm. why and how the mechanisms of that work, I start getting really excited. And, yeah. Uh, there. It seems like color and shape might be really important in food selection, and this was documented or or talked about at least by Pelham and Dixon in yeah. 1992. And uh, birds, this has been around for a while. They distinguish pretty well between salt, sweet, acid, and bitter. Do they basically. really? Yeah. But compared to mammals, they have a really poor sense of taste. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I think about, um, you know, like the bird seed that they make spicy. Have you seen that before? Mm. You haven't seen that? I don't think so. Yeah, they sell spicy bird seed to prevent squirrels from eating it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, And we're doing actually the same thing. I put, when I put my chicken feed out, Yeah. I put... Uh, cayenne pepper. In yeah, it. I think that's basically what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, there was another Cause example I, just to keep was... the rats out of it. Yeah. So, well, I had a whole bunch of other stuff that uh to go into this because we have some better mechanistic stuff from other species, mm-hmm. and I feel like we've kind of we're belaboring the turkeys, which I guess that's okay. I don't remember. How much did we talk about Menzer, Menzer's work? Did we do that last year in the Oak? We did, but um, I think it bears repeating. Okay. I mean, I've I've forgotten about a lot of it. You know, as you're going through some of this, I'm I'm recalling. I have forgotten about the study until I started doing this again. Yeah, I was actually when you were starting to go into that, I was like, man, what was the name of that author? You know, I remember talking about it, it was a really <laughs> cool study. He did it like, you know, on his farm. Where he lived, yeah. I think. Yeah, well, a flock I, of turkeys. Think, yeah, and I think I told some stories about. Yeah, you did. Like he used to do the jelly bean thing to look yes. at the color preference. Yeah, like yeah, that. like the turkeys lived on the hill up behind his house, and they'd you know come yeah. down and feed around the farm, and so he put out different you know smorgasbords yeah. for them and, <laughs> and looked at what they ate. That's so cool. Yeah, this curiosity and an absolute obsession with turkeys. Yeah. So, I always appreciated that about him. Yeah, he basically concluded in that Menzer et al. 1995 
that nut size was the important factor that was makes sense dictating it. Yeah. Um, uh, for Miriam's turkeys, they hypothesized in one of the studies. It was a Wake Wing study, Wake Wing and Rogers, nineteen ninety five. They hypothesized that the preference for Miri by Miriam's for uh acorns was much greater than the other small seeded things in Miriam range, like uh pinion pine, ponderosa pine mm-hmm. seeds. But that was in they were uh they formed that hypothesis based on optimal foraging theory. Yeah. Basically there would the turkey would get more out of things that can swallow that are bigger. Yeah. Right? But yeah. then you hit some threshold like some of those seed you know, those seeds we talked about a minute ago, like pecans or whatever, might be too big for them just to ingest. Yeah. But you do see high, I guess there, there could be high use of those because you see so much seed ver- size variation across individuals. Yeah. Like everybody, I hear about this all the time. Like, you know, you got a couple of white oaks that are producing. Some of them might be really long and narrow acorns, and then other ones are you know, really, uh, like girthy in comparison, you know, it's just like a, <laughs> or round, uh, just round. Yeah. So you'd probably see differential use of, of the same species, even yeah. based on some of those traits. And I've seen pretty wide variation across those, but I wonder if that's, um, I wonder if that's related to, cause I remember back when we were on gamekeepers a while back and we were talking about this very topic and, Something came up about, you know, even when within the same species, so let's just take white oak as an easy example, that you see, like, I think we were talking about deer in particular having preference for certain, the acorns from certain white oaks over others. Mm -hmm. And it's not immediately obvious why they would prefer that that particular tree, but it makes you wonder, like, there's got to be, you know, if there's just the shape can differ, maybe there's just Mm -hmm. small small differences in the taste you know i mean you even think about like uh like vineyards and how grapes grown in different soils produce wines with different flavor profiles like i wonder if Mm -hmm. are are turkeys acorn sommeliers (laughs) 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 i didn't think we would go there today but here we are you can't ever tell (laughs) Well, let, let's uh, let's dig in a little bit on some of this stuff. Yeah, because you just said something that made me think of one thing that has been kind of striking to me, I guess, mm-hmm. for the the studies, you know, as a whole. And and if you if you kind of like zoom out and look at this, in terms of all wildlife species, we have better data, especially for small mammals. Mm-hmm. But I would say there's a fair amount of literature. The study that I found that, you know, I wanted to talk about today is on chipmunks. It was from 1993. Pierre et al. We'll say P-Y-A-R-E. I'm just going with it. (laughs) Yeah, let's go with it. They did a study with chipmunks and showed that the low tannin white oak were mm-hmm. uh, they had white oak and Quercus rubra? What red oak? Northern red. Northern red oak. So they had low tannin and high tannin, mm-hmm. and they did show that the chipmunks had a preference for the low tannin, which you sure. hear that all the time. Yeah, but they noted in here that there's one confounding problem with their study, and that is the acorn structure, size, you know, thickness of the shell, all of those other things also co-vary with the same thing. Sure. So they, they noted that in here that they did find this apparent preference for the low, low tannin, Mm -hmm. but the white oak also had desirable characteristics like the size of the acorn and, and uh, how easy it was to get to the meat of the acorn, the uh, meat to shell ratio like there's a bunch of factors that might play into that selection that they can't rule out Mm -hmm. right based on their study the meat to shell ratio you know what you made (laughs) me think about when you said that 
You made me think about eating crab legs. Hey now. <laughs> Which crab I leg just, do you do you preferentially went, pick up for the from the plate first? Yeah. I went Italian on it. I was thinking about like a calzone or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, I remember there was something I was gonna ask you earlier. Did when you were I mean, I don't pull mean to pull us back, but at the same time it's something I have to ask. Did you find much about um turkey use of hickories and pecans since we mentioned that? No, the only thing I can think of was from Billy Menzer's where he was providing them. But they were shelled. Were they shelled? I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember. Surely they were. Because, I, I mean, I, and the reason that I wanted to ask that is that, you know, I commonly assume that, you know, that genus is not very important as a food food source to turkeys just because of the relative inaccessibility of it. When it's got the husk on it and everything. You could see circumstances where they might eat it yeah though like if it's made available to them in another way Mm -hmm. like a squirrel yeah eats it and then drops part of it or whatever. sure i mean you know that happens but you wonder like what is the relative you know proportion of calories during that time of the year that they're consuming from that mast versus oak mast yeah i would guess it's very small probably I haven't seen much on it, so I'm assuming that it doesn't occur that commonly. Yeah. Okay, sorry for backtracking us, but I had to know. No, that's good. You know, and uh, like we we could have ten more episodes on this topic. I mean, it's mm. just it's such a a dynamic topic and so interesting. And there's so many different ways to go with it. So if folks want us, I guess we can do more of it. How cool would it be to do a retrospective meta analysis going back in time if you could pair, um vital rate data from hens with mass crop data. They really legit. So you're getting me sidetracked. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm thinking about this selection thing and I'm trying yeah. to get to it and we're <laughs> I'm just having fun <laughs> and I think people enjoy I, that. I'm I'm being curious and having fun. I know. And I appreciate that. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want to lose this thought because it was kind of striking to me. <laughs> When I was looking, you know, the tannin example I just gave you, it's, that's like a primary hypothesis. How yeah. many times have you heard that? Many, many, many. That, that uh, yeah, every the wildlife like the white oak acorns more, that subgenus, because of low tannin. Right. Which there is evidence of that. I think with the chickmunk study, what I would have done is make it independent. You know, I would have isolated the the meat quality from all the other factors. So yeah. I'd have thrown a bunch of them in a, I'd have hold them, put them in a blender, blended it up, made an exactly just the same size thing and done that. And I would have also done it with like 10 species of each. Yeah. And then you could actually detangle quality from structural things or whatever. So how do you put it back in the hole? Cause that, I don't that think seems... you can. I think you'd have to, look at to see is there a preference related to qualities yeah because i would think the whole would matter too right because you pick up the average sound northern red oak acorn and the average sound white oak acorn and you try to crack them with your hands white oak almost nine times out of ten is going to be easier to crack right yeah well there are there is some data that's get trying to get at that I mean, it certainly is playing a role, like what we were talking about with turkeys. Some of the mm-hmm. species, the whole is is protecting the acorn or the other mass species completely the nut, from them. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's go to some birds. There's a study that was published by Richardson et al. in 2013. That's acorn foraging preferences for four species of free-ranging avian seed predators in the eastern deciduous forest. Man, they threw a lot of adjectives in there. (laughs) (laughs) They were very precise in what they were studying. Yeah, so they looked at uh, preference of, of these four bird species for acorns of white, black, and pan oak. Okay. A little better. Uh, and they put acorns on, they did these discrete choice 
uh, experiments where essentially they're putting the acorns together in the same place and letting animals come and then pick between them. Mm-hmm. And they're doing it out, you know, they got like a platform out in the woods somewhere or whatever. Basically setting up somewhere. a buffet. Yeah. And uh, they were basically videoing the, the animal use. Right. So the they have really good data on blue jays, red-bellied woodpeckers, and tufted titmice and white-breasted nuts, nuthatches. So I know folks on here don't necessarily know what any of those are or care about them, but it is None pretty interesting. None of those are turkeys, Marcus. <laughs> I know. It is pretty interesting because it starts to shed some light on this. So when I was talking about the tannins earlier, the thing that's been striking to me is that we don't have very much evidence that the quality of the acorn, in terms of the nutritional quality, which might include the, the tannin, that's a negative quality, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But there's also positive qualities, like just what's in the acorn nutrient-wise. There's not that much evidence of things selecting based on those qualities. Yet another potential example of just because something stands to reason doesn't mean it's true. And I'm not right. saying that, that the tannin hypothesis is false, just that maybe it's not as cut and dry as we thought it was. Yeah. So in this study, they show blue jays uh, had preferences in this order. They liked pin oak first, more than black oak, more than white oak. Yeah. And red-bellied woodpeckers had basically the same, but it was slightly weaker. Wait, what species of bird did you start with? Blue jays. Blue jays, okay. So it would make sense. A, a blue jay is kind of a medium-sized bird. Um, yeah. Pin oak acorns are small. It would make sense that they would consume yeah. those first, preferentially. But the pin oaks um, probably had... Yeah, so this here's the thing about it. It actually... And this is very consistent about animals that do what they do. Mm-hmm. They cache the acorns. Yeah. So it's actually about, it seems to be, and this is consistent across a bunch of species, not just birds even, uh, the, the selection of the acorn is being driven by how likely it is to survive in the cache and be good later. That's what I was thinking as soon as you said that. And that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, so the chemical and phys- physical attributes of those those acorns yeah. maximize the net value of the food as a cache. Yeah, red oak acorns are more cacheable. Mm-hmm. Yep, and you see a similar thing with some squirrel and uh, other small mammal caching species, The which is also good for the tree, yeah. right? Because you know, remember the squirrel death match at... By the way, I told the I told the story of the pilfering squirrels to my class yesterday, and they ate it up. They oh, really? It. Yeah, yeah. I like that, man. You know, I love to see people. You know, the light bulb turn on. Yeah, for students. Yeah, like they get really stoked about how awesome nature is. Yeah, and like there's so many cool things to learn about nature, and you know, I, I love seeing that light bulb turn on. Yeah. So, and it's the same kind of stuff that really has fascinated me from, you know, being really into it all the way, all the way since I could walk, basically. And I've always had that food preference thing. That's lingered all the way till now from when I was a very little child. Mm-hmm. In fact, I used to do these little, did I ever talk about that on the air? Where I used to do these little diet sex, selection trials? No. Yeah, I I did. Like, I, I mean, I was just, like, trying to think about how to fish better. Yeah. But I'd bring home stuff and, like, roll over logs, and my mom has all these pictures of me. We'll cut in. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll cut in a picture of me. I love that. Where I was, like, seeing, based on where the fish came from and what they had in their pond, what did they like best? And they like, trying to figure out what to fish with in the pond based on what was yeah. available. Like, did they like grub worms better or? I mean, it's just, it's always been there. I can remember sitting on a tree stand watching deer come through and eat on different things. And I just, 
like I couldn't understand why the deer would eat this leaf off of this species and not get another one. Yeah. Or it seemed like they like to eat under that white oak, but not this other one, even though there's acorns everywhere. You know, like the little things like that that I've just have sat there and contemplated even since I was little. You know, this all makes sense now. <laughs> because it's all coming together. <laughs> because so you did that and then you ended up, you know, pursuing a line of inquiry related to diet selection. Okay. Mm, I've done a lot of work on that, yeah. So do you know what I did when I when I would go out and catch stuff from, from the water? <laughs> I would bring them back to the house <laughs> and I'd put them in a little 10 gallon aquarium that I had out behind the house and I'd see who killed who. Oh, so, yeah. so I started my career by Were studying predation. <laughs> so I started predation <laughs> studies. Isn't that something? I'd bring back, I'd bring, you know, the crawfish always won. <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, I had a big crawl dad that, that, uh, killed a snake, man. In really the aquarium yeah yeah so i'd put i'd put the crawfish and the salamanders and the different species of fish and we'd have a like a royal death match in the aquarium <laughs> <laughs> and that's why i studied predation and you studied yeah. food choice <laughs> yeah well you could argue that could be food choice too that's, you know dual purpose <laughs> yeah i i did some stuff kind of like that i guess i'm too, sensing but... an opportunity for collaboration here yeah yeah <laughs> Which, you know, you've tinkered around in the diet choice stuff, and I've tinkered around yeah. in the predation stuff as well. Uh, but, yeah, so I guess for the, the take-home for our audience, if you got if you have kids and they have tendencies to be really curious about something like that, it may be an indicator of where they're going in life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you don't want them to end up like us, maybe discourage it. But if you do, <laughs> Well, the thing about it for me, and I, 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 you know, like hearing my mom's perspective on this because she just always kind of nurtured it, and so did dad. My obsession with it was pretty extreme. Yeah. Like I was, they they could drop me off at the at the pond that I would fish at a lot, and leave me there from literally daylight till dark, and mm-hmm. I would never like I would do it every single day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I was just obsessed with fishing. Mm-hmm. And the same with hunting. I wanted to be on the deer stand every single day. Yeah. And I, I would sit there all day long. Yeah, and I didn't it, have the opportunity to deer hunt um, that often behind the house, but squirrel hunting, definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, just whatever I had the opportunity, it didn't really, wasn't specific to a, any particular species, but it the fascination just was natural, and I, oh, I yeah. guess, was really focused on it. Yep. And yep. she would talk about how she literally would find snakes in my pocket. I'd come home with a boot full of fish mm-hmm. and crawdads and yep. all kinds of stuff. You know, just constant. Yeah. I, I just couldn't help it. So, you know, if you have a kid like that, they they might be destined to be a scientist <laughs> in a similar vein, but uh, yeah, I just I thought that was an interesting sidebar. It's so hard sometimes, like when the kids you know get into stuff like that and make messes and all that. We have these uh oh, well, I'm really sidetracking us now. <laughs> we have these invasive geckos all around our house. Yeah, and the kids have been really into that lately. Man, they they are pretty gnarly. Yeah. Yep. I don't care about them doing death matches with those because I'm like, you're doing an ecological service, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> well, I wanted to like, you know, I, I wanted to like wing shoot the black bird so I could put it in a cage so I could feed it all the different kinds of seeds and see which one, yeah. you know, like those are the kinds of things I was doing rather than trying to see if they would eat each other. <laughs> um, yeah, so... The those caching species, they're maximizing that value of the cache. Right. right? Uh, the tufted titmouse and the let's see, the white breasted nut hatches, they don't do that. And the the selection was different for those species. They're smaller birds. They don't. They're not caching it, and their preference was ordered. Uh, pin oak and white oak. 
were both highly preferred, uh, but not different from one another, but they were both highly preferred relative to the black oak, mm. which they attributed to, and uh, we'll link this paper, There are they have a body of evidence that suggests this might be true. The birds were, they're, they're selecting it based on the shell thickness. Like mm-hmm. How hard is it to break into it? Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So different species are definitely influenced by different characteristics. Right. But it does seem to be a little more complex, and it's most of the time not well explained by the quality of the acorn. Right. Yeah. Which I find kind of interesting. But let's switch gears. Uh, I, I wanted to try to focus on birds if I could. There's so much in ma- the mammal literature, but I'm intentionally sure. not focusing on that because turkeys are birds. Right. So Last we checked. Uh, yeah. I think that's still true. Uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> there was some cool work from Rick Kaminsky's shop at Mississippi mm-hmm. State back in the day, and he was uh, well known for doing waterfowl stuff for those right. out there. Uh, Lenny Brennan, I know you know that name, mm-hmm. uh, well known especially for quail mm-hmm. stuff that he's done over the, the years, but it was led by Scott Barras, and uh, this was Barras at all. 94, I think. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's 94, 96. Okay. And it's acorn selection by female wood ducks. This one is more in a line with something we talked about earlier what, that seems to be relevant for turkeys, where they were looking at common bottomland uh, red oak sure. species. And that was... Let's see, willow oak, water oak, cherry bark oak, and nut all oak. Mm -hmm. And willow oak was selected by far over equally available acorns of the other species. Okay. Didn't matter if the ducks were presented them as a single trial and quantified it that way where they had single species or if they put all the acorn species together and quantified the selection among them in sort of a choice trial like we were talking about so earlier. So cap- they had captive wood duck hens to do this? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, it didn't matter. They always selected willow oak. Okay. And the willow oak acorns had the smallest top width, thinnest sure. shell, and greatest meat to shell ratio. Mm. Sounds like a Yelp review. <laughs> I think I did leave a Yelp review a couple weeks ago that said exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the meat to shell the, ratio was superb. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's not clear exactly which of those traits, but it honestly, it's probably a combination of them. Yeah. The shell to meat ratio is really good and it's easier to swallow and the nutritional quality is fine in comparison to others. So uh, it's good to eat acorns and that's one they can get down. Yeah. I think we could probably gather from that, you know, that 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 might be common. Right. You know, driving selection. Right. And probably relevant for turkeys. So... There, there are two other studies that I wanted to talk about, and one of them is one of my shops, and I think it makes another important point. But uh, the other one, I think it would just be fun to bring in. It's sort of random. I feel like you're, <laughs> I feel, I feel like you're licking your chops over there, like you can't wait to drop the, yeah. some knowledge bomb from that one. So let's do them. Well, I just think it's going to catch you off guard, and that's what I was intentionally trying to do. Good. And one of my formal students, Emma Zaitler, will, uh, would really appreciate it. Okay. And anybody that knows her and what she was working on with me will know why right, right out of the gate. But, uh, like, I don't even need to say why, and yeah. they already know. But, uh, yeah, so one of my former students – Mariah Boggess, 
did a pretty cool experiment, and it's not the one that we talked about last time. He did a, multiple experiments during his his uh, master's research, and one of them we still need to analyze the data. We have a he did a choice trial with twenty oak species, mm-hmm. and uh, we have not gotten done modeling it yet. But we have lots of observations from a bunch of different species of wildlife and how they selected between you know, a wide range of, of oak species. That'll be one of the best diet selection studies when we finally get that turned around. Uh, yeah, but 20 anyway, species, that's a huge variety. Yeah, and there were a bunch of white oak and red oak in that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I'm really kind of hoping we can get that done sometime soon because we've, we've had the data set for years and still have not gotten it done. Yeah. But I do have a, a postdoc that's keenly interested in doing that now. So for the study we have published from Mariah's work, uh, this study we had eight oak species. So this was Bogus et al. When did he publish this? In 2023, I think. 2022. And uh, we'll we'll cut in, if you're watching on YouTube, some video footage from this because we had, he, he set it up where there's these trays they had acorns on, and it had sand in it, mm-hmm. white sand, so that yeah. it, just for high contrast. And right. we standardized that. So people always wonder, well, what? how's the sand affecting? Well, it's probably affecting the species to some degree, but it's standardized across the treatments. Right. So what we did in this was test a hypothesis related to selection of acorns that's kind of hinging on that that cacheability idea. And but it was also addressing a really important concern from a management standpoint. We've been talking about trying to broaden the the fire window. Mm-hmm. And a lot of folks in oak forests don't want to burn in the fall. Sure. And part of the reason is because this fear that we're going to cause a failure in recruitment of oaks. Mm-hmm. Because we burn over the acorns, yeah, and it kills all of them, right? And then for me, I was just interested. Well, we cook food. <laughs> you and I want to cook stuff, and I was yeah. like, well, "What happens to wildlife selection if you burn over a bunch of acorns and now they're cooked?" Yeah, right. So I just found that fascinating. So we did this experiment with these eight oak species. Some of them were pyrophytic oaks. Some of them are not. So we had that that dichotomy and we grouped species into what they would do with the acorn. So we Mm -hmm. have the species that would cache like squirrels or blue jays or whatever together. And then we had things that would eat the acorn like, uh, like deer and turkeys and, right. You know, various other species there. There's basically no survival of the acorn after it gets removed. Right. And we look to see how being exposed to fire affected the diet choice. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was pretty cool. One thing that folks may have heard about from this study, deer really like one of those. Do you remember which one it is? They really like one species of acorn or no, no, one, no. one treatment? One of the treatments of fire. Like whether fire has cooked the acorns or the acorns have just fallen off a tree, which one do you think they prefer? The cooked acorns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They love the cooked acorns. I know sense. what's happening right now. People are already out in the back <laughs> grabbing, <laughs> picking up acorns to go roast them. <laughs> uh, I was hoping they were going to burn their woods. <laughs> you were thinking about it differently. That's yeah. what I hope, too. I hope they were going to burn them. Uh, yeah, out of our be... diet trials, the deer ate almost <laughs> exclusively the burned acorns. Were you able to get at the mechanism behind that in any way? Mm-mm. Just hypothesize? Yeah, I I think it probably affects the digestibility of them. Yeah, I was thinking too that the shell would be, you know, like more uh like crunchy, like it would it would just, you mm-hmm. know, kind of like in the like a texture thing. Yeah, like <laughs> it would just it would it would kind of just crumble easier as yeah. opposed to if it were just green, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We had we We'll link this paper as well if people want to read what we thought. We have a discussion, you know, that uh, we we brought in a lot of literature to try to f- 
figure out what some reasonable explanations are of that. Yeah. But uh, the non-caching individual species in general, that was their their pattern. They yeah. preferred the acorns that had been exposed to fire. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, the caching species, most of them really preferred the acorns that had not been exposed to fire. Yeah, because they want them to last longer. They're selecting for a different reason. Yeah, they, it's about that cache, and uh, they want they didn't want to get acorns that they could go put in the cache that aren't alive and going right. to be able to what's you know sit there in it for a long time. So that seemed to to be the pattern for most of the species, and uh, you know I, I just found that that really interesting. And I don't know if you mentioned did the, so turkeys being a non-caching species, I assume they preferred the burned acorns as well. Yeah, and we didn't, so we separated deer out to look at deer. We did it with raccoons as well. Raccoons were more split. They didn't seem to strongly mm-hmm. pref- prefer them based on that. But turkeys, we did not have enough data to use yeah. them separately. We had them combined in the other group of non-cachers. Yeah, that's the hard part so, about and that, turkeys. And that whole, yeah, that's what I was saying. The, the study design wasn't really done well to isolate turkeys because it is just not detecting them very often. Right. So this is figure three that I'm looking at. If you zoom in on deer, would you like to know which species they preferred? I I didn't, actually, I didn't tell you which species I put in there. You said there were eight. Yeah, so there's black oak, cherry bark oak, northern red oak, nut all, scarlet, schumard, Southern red and willow, and we we all we used all non white oak because of a problem with white oak. They germinate, mm-hmm. right? So we we try to use a wide disparity of, of species within the red oak group because it, they, we could store them without them germinating, right? But if you put white oak in the fridge, they're going to germinate, right? So uh, that's why. We did have white oak species, and this was supposed to be far more, but basically we had a th- we couldn't do that part of it because they all germinated. <laughs> so we tried a couple of you things to learn. figure that out, <laughs> and uh, we just couldn't get around it, so we didn't for this one. Uh, yeah, so all those red oak species, which one do you think deer preferred the most? Did you say northern red was in there? Yeah, it's in there. I'll just go with that one because I have no idea about differential – preference for no red oak group no this is one that actually it wasn't that surprising to me because of my interactions with jenny jones Mm -hmm. when i was in an undergrad at mississippi state i remember her saying this and you know because it was about diet selection that just kind of bounced around in my head for a long time but uh it was southern red oak okay yeah and i remember her saying in terms of the the qualities that are attractive to a, a something that wants to eat an acorn, yeah. the southern red oak was far better, more digestible than uh, the, most of the white oak subgroup even. Really? Yeah. And uh, she was just talking about the strong preference for that. Huh. So the, the gray squirrels, we didn't see really strong preference across species. And let's see. For raccoons, they really liked black oak. The one that nobody else likes. <laughs> what Bunch of world? weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. The other group. Of all the choices they could make, that certainly was one of them. <laughs> yeah. So, the other group, which included turkeys, which I think the other group, uh, we didn't have that many detections in that group, and I think a lot of them were turkey. Mm-hmm. So it includes some other stuff, but uh, you know that is probably more representative of turkey. Southern red oak was definitely preferred in that one, but it was kind of a small sample size problem with it. Yeah, I, w- I wish you had a bigger sample size for that because you know, like we talked about with Dudley, I've always thought about the smaller seeded red yeah. oak 
group species being the best, you know, acorn producers for turkeys. Yeah. Well, that I think it, I wish we would have had better data, but it does seem to align with that. Right. Where, let's see, the, yeah, cherry bark would be one of them. Willow oak is one of them that's definitely doing pretty good. Yeah. So I'd expect willow to probably be a little bit higher than southern red instead of what you found. They, yeah, it's hard to make that inference, yeah. but they are definitely, you know, uh, they like in there. Them. Black oak was, well, I don't think we had one in that group eat one of those. So this can definitely be improved on, but it tested the hypothesis really well. It was very good study designed mm-hmm. to see if burning over the acorns mattered. And there's a body of work on that. We know that exposing the acorns to fire does decrease their germination rate. Mm-hmm. And, but we know that the prepping of the site for, like if you burned and then acorns fall on that exposed ground, yeah. they fare better. Yeah. Squirrels and other things tend to prefer to cache them in the burned area and cached acorns in the burned area also germinate and do better. Yeah. But the limitation was, oh, well, we're going to kill all the seeds, so all that stuff doesn't matter. Right. But that uh, that doesn't seem to be true, and it seems like the the caching species, what's, what's essentially happening is some of the acorns don't get killed, and the caching species would select those, mm-hmm. right, the sound acorn. Right. And go cash it, and they tend to do it in the burned area. So yeah. you probably end up with a net benefit, even though some of the seeds are perfect. Die. Yeah. I talked yeah. about this yesterday in class, and when I was talking about the pilfering squirrels, just about, you know, in general, the fire ecology of oaks and, you mm-hmm. know, how fire can be an essential part of their, you know, regeneration. Yeah. And how, you know, combining shelter wood and fire for that reason is one of the preferred regeneration techniques. Yeah. So I, w- I was kind of hopeful when I saw this, like, oh, well, a lot of our species we care about that, like deer, kind of, they desire those those burnt acorns, right. and then it probably would have a net positive effect of burning at that time on oak regeneration. Yeah. Uh, because by burning know. through them, you've kind of, uh, well, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. So a lot of stuff going on, but we'll link this one if folks want to read through that. We, I think, made a pretty strong case that that, that it's probably a net positive to the system in terms of the oak regeneration and and everything. Yeah, let's get on to the last one that I had. Okay. <laughs> and uh, here, here's the gobble for Charlotte. <laughs> it's hard to make this shit up. <laughs> Well, that was a, that was actually a pun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I missed that. <laughs> well, you you didn't you don't. There's no reason you should have known it was a pun, <laughs> but you'll realize why it was in a minute. So there's actually you know people really loved the the squirrel death match. So mm-hmm. I was thinking, well, well, there's more. Mm-hmm. So we have these these wily little critters some people may see them and not know what they are but we have all these species of dung beetles i know you love a good dung beetle <laughs> dung beetle is pretty remarkable honestly here it goes in some systems they seem to be standing there waiting on poo to fall out of a mammal to bury it right I've heard like you it's talk remarkably about. remarkably fast I've never heard anyone get as fired up talking about <laughs> dung beetles as you. And and this is not the first occasion. Yeah. So that's why I said you can't make this shit up. That was the pun. <laughs> so when I was working with Emma, who, who the reason I, I brought it, she got, she, she kind of came from a background of ecology where she was really interested in entomology. And she came on to study deer and fire interactions. And, uh, she was thinking, well, I'll collect deer scat, you know, to look at what's what they're uh, they're eating in these fire treatments. That you know, it was, we were looking at uh, fire season, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, you're not gonna be able to do that. And she looked at me like, what do you mean? 
And then I told her the story about my PhD research where I was sitting on a deer stand and I I was trying to collect deer scat to do these uh, histological, microhistological surveys mm-hmm. so they could quantify all the different plants being selected in their diet. Mm-hmm. Well, you have to collect fresh feces to mm-hmm. do that. And maybe I've talked about this on the air before. I don't, I don't know think I so. Well, I remember sitting on the deer stand, and I know Chip Wood's sitting there washing dishes right now, and he already knows. He remembers this. I know he does. Saying, Anna, come in here and listen to this. <laughs> I was sitting on the deer stand in N17. He knows right where that's at. And a deer came out, and the doe hung out outside of our drip line. You know, I couldn't fire the dart. She was just a little too far. Mm-hmm. But I watched her, and then she defecated right there in the in and i looked i marked it you know it was like okay that's right where it's at and when i get down i'll go You're get chomping that. at the bit to get because i and need the those turds. <laughs> well i got down and i looked everywhere for it i could not find it and i was like i know it was right here so yeah. we got the whole team of people out there we've got like <laughs> eight people out there and we combed the damn plot and could not find it and it just bothered the heck out of me and then we were down in another plot. Uh, uh, you'll have to forgive me, Chip. What I can't remember what it was, but it's the one between the two impact areas, and I can't think of what the name of the plot was. But uh, we were in that plot, and I just happened across a dung beetle rolling a, a deer pellet mm-hmm. in the plot while we were mm-hmm. looking for scat because I was having to do these surveys all the time. Right. And I. And I just got fascinated with him, so I started watching him, and he he rolled it a little further and then rolled it down into a hole. So then I was like, what the heck? So I dug the little hole up, and it was just full of deer pellets. There you go. So anyway, I told her about this. There's and a actually, whole dissertation chapter right there in that dung beetle's hole. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I actually did a little experiment where I was trying to figure out how old dung would be, and I realized real quick that... uh. The dung isn't going to be old because the dung beetles are on top of it so fast it's gone yeah. during the summer. Right. You know, you know, if it's in the winter when they're not active, right. it's not as big a deal. But anyway, I told her about that story. And I was like, I, in the longleaf system, I, I don't think they're, you're going to be able to find any scat during the summer. Like, it's all going to be gone by dung beetles. So then she wanted to do some dung beetle work. But anyway, we went through all that to say she stumbled across the study and because we had other people working on oaks in the lab and she knew I had somebody working on seed dispersal related to the fire and then she was real interested in that she knew I was going to be fired up when she told me about it Mm -hmm. but a bunch of dung beetles either mistakenly think acorns are dung or they diet switch when there's not much dung available and they will go and roll acorns and bury them everywhere no in the woods yes and uh there is some evidence that they are treating it like a food source like they would dung yeah so they are eating it but they apparently in some cases are playing a pretty important role as a seed disperser for oaks and other other species as well by dispersing the fruit or the the seed itself and not dispersing the dung it's in in other words that's really interesting so i found found that really interesting i thought people would appreciate yeah you know that we're thinking about all this stuff and and you know there's other things like this like in this study that i pulled up let's see this was uh perez ramos at all 2007 acorn removal and dispersal by dung beetles and the ecological implications. And they showed in that study, even with all the other stuff, eating acorns and moving them around and all that, 6% of the acorns were being dispersed into, you know, and uh, buried by dung beetles. No way. Isn't that something? 6%. <laughs> yeah. I have seen some turkey studies that have shown, like, turkeys are eating less than 6% of the acorns. Yeah. I mean, like we talked, we were talked about earlier at the beginning of this episode. You know, it usually might be around twenty percent, but I mean, mm-hmm. there's some studies where it's lower. That's a lot. I mean, my point is that's a lot of acorns that beetles are taking. Yeah, yeah and that 
that varies a lot based on which species are available and all that. And I think this study was e- it was even in an oak forest in a different different place. Yeah, this was in Spain. So who knows what how that varies from site to site? But mm-hmm. I just found it kind of remarkable. It's fascinating that we have stuff like that going on. Yeah. And then in some cases, it definitely is because they got fooled. Yeah. Like the acorn resembles scat. Yeah. And some sure. plants are even trying to resemble it. Yeah. But uh, that's so funny. I just found it really interesting. I thought this would be a fun little factoid to yeah, throw in here. See how f- folks like it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think they appreciate it. Obviously, if they're still listening, they do. I, I mean, know. but uh, it's just fascinating how complex our world is. You know. Yeah. I I got I like that kind of stuff because yeah. I want to know. You know, that for the oak, it matter, matters a lot because it's trying to produce the next generation, right? And Mm -hmm. some of those might be because you fooled a few dung beetles into burying your seed somewhere. Well, until I became friends with you, I thought dung beetles, you know, occurred somewhere exotic. I didn't even realize we had them here. (laughs) Well, we, like, since I worked with her, I'd started to realize, oh, crap, they're they're all around us all the time. Was that pun intended too? (laughs) No, (laughs) but it was a good one. (laughs) So... I guess if folks will let us know if they don't want us to bring in these little kinds of tidbits. I mean, we could have just ended the, we had a pretty decent episode just focused on what the turkeys were doing. Yeah, we did. But uh, I thought it might be fun to kind of explore some of these things. I think they uh, enjoy it. Throw this in at the end. There's another one, you see. (laughs) I enjoyed it. (laughs) Yeah. I know the objective well, isn't necessarily for us to enjoy it, but I think everybody else has a better listening experience when we do. So, Well, I I think I might disagree with you on that. Part of my objective is for us to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> if we weren't enjoying it, I don't think we'd be doing it. That's true, too. Yeah. So, And I definitely, you know, I know you've got a few things that you've been hankering to, to drop on me. You know, I know it's all I supposed do. to be a pun right there. <laughs> Uh, that might have been too far, but <laughs> the line has been crossed. <laughs> Let our ratings and reviews be reflect that. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, we brought up the passenger pigeon thing and the 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 uh, chestnut thing. You know, we've talked about several yeah. things like that, and it's like our most requested topic right now. I know. Well, it's not even about turkeys. Well, most people are thinking about deer right now, anyways. Um, yeah. So, well, you know, we've got a little bit of downtime until things ramp back up and, you know, yeah. around the new year. So, when, you know, we do have a knack for figuring out ways to relate it back. And sometimes yeah. we have to do it that way. Right. We don't have the information on turkeys directly, so we have to go go around through the literature through other species. So, You know, I think if there's to the five people who are still listening – one of them is my mom. I love you, mom. Thank you for still listening. <laughs> but uh, there's you know, no one I, in my family. I, well, actually, my brother listens sometimes. I don't know if anybody else is. I'll but. connect this back to turkeys, and this is something that that we probably I don't know that we have ever discussed on this podcast. But um, the forest inventory and analysis data, which you know I'm sure you're familiar with, this is a data set that's go, mm-hmm. that goes back a long time. There's these fixed plots. Um, throughout the country where, you know, that are visited periodically to look at how forest composition is changing over time. And in Eastern hardwood forest, Marcus, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but um, there have been some papers published talking about how oaks are declining, right? Mm -hmm. The the amount of oaks that are dominant or co-dominant in Eastern deciduous forest have been declining steadily over time. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about things like, you know, fire and seed caching and all those things that contribute to developing advanced oak regeneration that can ensure that continuity of mass production long term, Mm -hmm. right? Because oak trees age out. We've talked about that before on the podcast, I know. Um, That is important. Yeah, we've talked about mesification. Yes. That's based on that same premise. Yeah. Done some work with some others on that. Yeah. So basically over time, like the land use patterns have changed in such a way that it favors oak recruitment less and it favors recruitment of those mesophytic species more um so you you know they're basically getting attacked from two different fronts at the same time Mm -hmm. and so you know 
these uh, processes that result in recruiting new oak trees are very important to turkeys, you know, long term from a conservation perspective. Yeah. Well, it may not directly affect us, but it might our grandkids. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking about this as a sustainable thing over longer than just my life. Yeah, and that, that's, that's like a mic drop moment right there. Speaking of which, we need to drop this mic and move on. All right. <laughs> we both got, got uh, things we got to go do. All right, man. Enjoyed it. Cool. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.